And thank you, Meg. What a wonderful presentation and um, uh, what a, a, a joyous and also sad uh, story that you shared, the, the, the ups and the downs. Um, I'd like to put a little bit of more context from the Portland story, uh, having come here on the tail end of that time, and also talk a little bit about what that means for us today. So in those years of 92 to 94, I was a student down in Berkeley in, uh, in, uh, in California and heard about the ballot measure in Oregon and wondered what, what is going on with all those people up in Oregon. And little did I know that when I came to be in search for a congregation a couple of years later, um, it turned out that the Portland congregation, which had grown in large part due to the witness of, of its uh, against those ballot measures, that I would end up being called here as, as a minister. And I didn't know what I was getting into. I was a young, not all that long out of the closet gay man and new minister. And, um, and I didn't see myself as any kind of an activist. That just wasn't part of how I necessarily saw myself. Um, but I had, through a friend, uh, been connected with Marilyn Sewell and we seemed to, to, to do well together. And, I ended up being I ended up being called here in 1995. I want to say that um, uh, the the witness that witness time was led to a transformation at First Unitarian Church of Portland. Um, the gay and lesbian people who I talked to talked about being stepchildren in the congregation in those years leading up to it. That the um, uh, they felt overlooked. They were kind of like the child in the family that wasn't, shouldn't really say what they needed because they just didn't feel particularly safe in the congregation. They were their own little community within the church. So when, um, when the ballot measures happened in 19, the first one in 1992, um, I don't know that it was clear how public the church would be against that. And there was a deep sense of unsafety not so much in the church, but certainly in the world. I'll note that um, part of the story is that, that um, our gay and lesbian folks will talk about how that was a transformational time that they were largely not out of the closet. And that right wing work called them out of the closet and transformed their lives in ways that they uh, couldn't imagine. So Meg, when you talk about the burning bush, I think that was uh, happened in in many ways for, for many people. I also want to note that um, Marilyn Sewell was a new minister at that point. She was actually one of the first women to be called to a senior minister role in a large church. And believe it or not, even in 1992, that was a pretty big deal. But I think one of the pieces of the story that I appreciate is that Marilyn didn't know what she was getting into when she wrapped that block. I think that a lot of more experienced ministers would have said, I'm not going to touch this with a 10 foot pole. But she did. Um, as Meg mentioned, it was the call of the youth um, and the work with Outside In, one of our community partners. And they did that. And it was a transformational moment. One little part of the story that I've always loved is that Marilyn uh, did a news conference to uh, talk about the wrapping of the block. And it happened to be on the same day that our Women's Alliance was meeting. Now the Women's Alliance goes back to the founding of the church. There was a group of women that founded the church. And in those days, they, while well, they still have a monthly luncheon, but in those days, I'm told that some of them even wore white gloves to their luncheon. And so here's the new minister in front of the church at the news conference. And behind her are the matriarchs of the church in their white gloves. And that led a lot of credibility to that news conference. And so just in the spirit of everybody has a role, um, I've always uh, loved that part of the story that the matriarchs of the church were very much, were very much there. That event, uh, I think, you know, as some of you know, the church grew in membership by 40% in one year. And so it, it really kind of expanded the church and in some ways almost just completely enlarged its sense of mission and witness. Um, people will talk about how the church in the years prior, justice or social concerns as it was called back then, um, 
they would choose one topic a year and they'd spend most of their energy debating on what that one topic would be. And the, 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 the witness against ballot measure nine, I think really was kind of the beginning of our current social justice witness in that it has a number of facets and, and I think started to talk about some, some intersectionality. Um, uh, but the church also had to build structures to support all these new people who were coming in and calling a second minister was part of that. So that's the uh, milieu into which, into which uh, I, I came and, and uh, that, was, that was a blessing. I wanna note that um, when I first came to the church, it was, it, it was, I felt very welcomed in the church in general. I do recall one older straight white man who told me I was not welcome at the church. He told me that all of the straight men had left the church, which was really quite a, quite a surprising statement, but that was his view of things. Um, I think I was actually more nervous about being an out gay minister than the church was about having an out gay minister. The church, because of that transformation, actually seemed pretty cool. And I, on the whole, felt a great deal of support. But in those early years, every time I got into the pulpit, I would, I would, I had knots in my stomach on Sunday mornings because I didn't know how safe it was. And I just want to know to connect it to current times. In the last two, three months, I have that same feeling and I've actually been grateful that we are not we do not have open doors that we are recording on Sundays and we're, and blessedly we're broadcasting, but that sense of unsafety has come back. And just to note the, um, it does feel very much connected. The, the targets feel broader now, uh, but the, that sense of unsafety and what is being unleashed. And so it, um, uh, it is a, uh, um, it's, it's troubling but maybe not surprising to be taken back to, to these times, how it is all connected. I think now having our Black Lives Matter banner on the church very much continues that witness that um, uh, happened, started years ago. And then too, we get calls about, you know, don't all lives matter, et cetera. But it's very much a connection of that justice witness that now in our times in particular, it's bearing witness to black lives, indigenous lives. Um, it's bearing witness to trans lives that the particularities of the witness maybe shift some, but it's all part of this whole and that that's, I think our work today. So it's good to, it's good to be here. So Meg, I'd, I'd like to ask a question. So, so given, given the times we're in and I'm often asked, what is it that we can do? What, if, if there's something that I can do in my life to bear witness and to work for justice, to live out my faith, um, what are some of the things that, that you would point us towards that you, was, that you would call us towards? Well, as congregations, I would start with the safety of the most vulnerable people who are in the congregation and related to the people in the congregation, because you don't have to look far to, you know, and I think COVID in a way has started that for a lot of congregations where people are checking in on the wider community, but, you know, there, there are particular people with real concrete needs right now that I, I would start with care. You know, I, I think that's one thing that um, Black Lives of UU does so beautifully is always keep care in the center of the work that's done. And, um, and I, I have realized at times when the assault uh, is directed, because um, I'm the parent of a, of a trans kid, when it comes into my heart, I, it means something when people reach out to me. It means something. It's not just an idea and an abstraction. It's very, these assaults are very, they are leveled at people's bodies. And so responding to the people in the congregation who are trans, who are BIPOC, who are, have disabilities, you know, really making, that's where I'd start. And I, then I think those conversations would lead to what's next. 
um, at least they always have for me.